Thank you for the introduction. My name is Eli Bierstein. As Wendy said, I work at Google, and this is a joint work with Nick Mick and so on. And today I would like to talk to you about how can we can rethink uh, how to we detect child sexual abuse on the internet. Before getting started, a word of caution. Uh, this is a very difficult topic, and while I'm not going to show any abusive material, I know it might be triggering, so by all means, do whatever you need to feel comfortable even stepping out of the room. Um, by all means, feel free to be in a safe environment. So, child, ab child sexual abuse is one of the most horrifying crime, and the World Health Organization uh, estimates that hundreds of millions of children are victims of it through the world. Today, I would like to focus on a specific aspect of it, which is the online child sexual abuse. Uh, we define it as the production, distribution, and consumption of child sexual abuse material that we also commonly refer to as CSAP. So child abuse, online child sexual abuse ecosystem have shifted with technology over the last two decades. For example, uh, camera phones have made it easier for pedophiles to produce content. Uh, the explosion of rich media have led to a diversification of the type of media which have been shared. Every online services and technology is abused by those pedophiles to create uh, international cross-border uh, ring designed to exchange this type of malevolent content. And finally, any type of digital distribution technology is weaponized by those guys to share their content. So, in the last three years, we've been working with Nick Mick to understand how the ecosystem has shifted along technology and identify key challenges. We were able to find five major challenges that I'm going to go through today uh, with you. And more specifically, what I would like to do is reflect with you on what type of technology we can help build uh, to make the internet free of child abuse. What can we do? So I'm going to give you some ideas and some example of instances of those technology to help drive the conversation. Before I get to that, um, let me take a moment and tell you about who is NICMIC because some of you might not be familiar with it. NICMIC uh, stands for the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. It is a US NGO in charge of processing any type of child abuse report, whether it's trafficking or sexual abuse and so f and, or even missing kids. If you ever have received a Amber Alert, uh, the Amber Alert is issued by NICMIC. So how that works? Well, somewhere on the internet, the public or a online services is going to find a piece of content that they believe is uh, sexual abuse uh, for children, and they will uh, report that content to NICMIC. NICMIC analysts will then review the content, determine its origin, and refer it to the most competent law enforcement agency in the hope that they can find the predator, rescue the child, and close the case. Then, often, uh, the law enforcement will provide feedback to NICMIC, which compiles statistics about the whole ecosystem. NICMIC is one of the many clearing houses around the world, and for example, we have the Internet Watch Foundation in the UK, as well as the Kennedy Center for Child Protection in Canada. What makes NICMIC unique is, by law, any US company has to report any potential piece of child sexual abuse material to NICMIC, and as a result, they are processing the vast majority of the reports. This gives them a unique perspective and vantage point when it comes to understanding how the ecosystem have evolved over the last 20 years. So let's delve into the challenges we are facing today. The first one is the number of reports has grown exponentially over the last two decades. So the best way for me to show you that is to tell you that in 1998, when Nick Mick tried to process those reports, they received about 3,000 reports. Fast forward, in 2018, Nick Mick has received over 18 million reports. That is a chilling 6,000x increase of content. This onslaught of reports have created a lot of strain on the whole ecosystem and the ability to process those reports quickly and get to rescue the kids as fast as possible. So what we can do 
is try to help them develop technology which are based, which can analyze the content and help them to prioritize the most informative report first so we can get to the kid as fast as possible. Here's one example of a project we're working on uh, to help out. The idea is the following. Uh, when we receive a piece of content, an image, uh, what we can do is we can apply AI to do face detection, not recognition, face, simple face, face extraction and say how many faces there is in the images. Then we take this these faces and we apply another round of AI, uh, this time to extract face characteristics such as genders, hair colors, eye colors, is it an adult, is it a children? And then we can combine those with some sort of decision logic to say if the, if the images have information which can help analysts and law enforcement to uh, identify who are the victim and the perpetrators. Then we assign a value to the reports, uh, high priority, medium priority, or low priority. In that case, if you have two faces, you're probably going to put a high priority. On the flip side, if you have an image which maybe is a landscape, then the AI will tell you where there is no faces, so there is not much for you to look at, and the decision logic will uh, issue a, small, a lower score, uh, probably like a low priority image. It's not to say that the image should not review, because all images should be reviewed, it's just that it's going to be reviewed, uh, hopefully, uh, after the most informative ones. So we built such a system in partnership with Storm and Nick Mick. Uh, it's an open source TensorFlow-based system, uh, which is going to be made available through Torn. Torn is a nonprofit, which is meant to build technology to help different child children with the help of technology. Uh, let me now show you on benign images how the system will look like, so you get a better feeling of it. Here is an old photo of me uh, at DEF CON with my wife, and uh, when we apply the system to it, in the first stages, as I explained, is going to find there is two faces. Then we apply the second round of AI, and this AI will actually extract characteristics for, which will tell you that, yes, I'm a male, I'm a young adult, at least at that time, and uh, I have black hair, and uh, I have a cover, which is my uh, famous cap. On the, f on the other side, my wife is categorized as a female, uh, a little bit harder for the machine learning because she's sideways, and then she's also a young adult, have black hair, and have no head cover. So it gives you an idea of the type of information we can add to the images, which helps to understand whether or not they are easy to process. Here, and so hopefully the system will tell you it's a fairly informative images. Here is a not so informative images, so this time, uh, when, we do facial, uh, when we do facial analysis, then the system will say, well, the person has facial hair, a beard, and uh, sunglasses. So as a result, it's harder for a human being to recognize the face because it's mostly masked. So in that case, the image contains information, but a little bit less. So we're going to call it a less informative images. And obviously, if you were to put a beautiful landscape through the system, then, well, it will tell you there is no faces, so that's a low priority images because there is nothing uh, which are easily interpretable. It doesn't mean there is no clue. You could imagine that a picture with, for example, a well-known landscape or well-known places might be giving clue to the analyst and law enforcement, so all images need to be processed. It just helps you to know which one you get and should go first. And that's obviously only one of the things we can do, and maybe you guys have, can come up with a better idea or different ideas that can help. The second challenges we are facing is that most of the content reported is only reported once. Uh, for example, for images, 84% of the images reported to NICMIC, at least as of 2017, were reported only once. Similarly, for, for videos, 91% of the video reported have been only reported once. So this leads us with this challenge that, well, most blacklisting is completely inefficient because we have a very, very long tail. So what can we do about it? Well, what we can do is try to build content-aware detection system that helps to ensure that new content is quickly identified and reported. Here's one example of such a system. Uh, it was initially developed uh, internally at Google to, pro to review our own content, and we are extending it uh, to any NGO and small companies so who can benefit from it. It's a machine learning classifier which is trying to look at an image and combine with decision logic tell you whether or not it is a potential child abuse imagery and you should review it. 
So it helps you to go faster and narrow down the list of potential images that should be reviewed by analysts uh, for child abuse. Another very experimental thing we are trying to do is try to use deep learning to identify related images. It's still in the early stages, but the idea is uh, we can try to fingerprint the content uh, with deep learning and then use it to find matching sets. Usually when we have a content, it's not one image, it's a set of images belonging to the same victim and the same places. So hopefully the machine learning can learn uh, to recognize those sets and help us to find related content in a more efficient manner. These are two examples of what we can do. I'm sure there are many others that can be developed and can help alleviate this problem. Our third challenge is that the media which are reported to NICMIC have been rapidly diversifying. Uh, back in 2016, about one in 16 were videos. Fast forward, in 2018, we are now close to parity. I don't have the exact number, but we were very, very close even in 2017 to have almost a parity between images and video. As a result, uh, we need to find and we need to develop ways to have reliable de detections across all medias so we keep up with the diversification of the content. This is not only images and video, it's also document and chat messages and so forth. One of the efforts in that direction is the release of the YouTube fingerprinting technology which helps uh, building a list of known uh, abusive videos to have fingerprint. Uh, there are probably a lot of initiatives to do around alternative content, and that's probably one of the places where technology can really make a big difference. Our fourth challenge is that child abuse is cross-border. Let me give you a concrete example. Back in 2016, the FBI and Interpol took down a, a, black, a dark web forum called the Playpen. So Playpen boasted about 150,000 members who were exchanging uh, pedophile content. This takedown led to the arrest of 548 uh, people around the world, including in the United States, in Europe, but also small countries in Asia. And we were, uh, they were able to rescue 296 children uh, based on those arrests. This gives you an idea of how diverse it is. Um, another way to look at it is a map of where NICMIC reports are going through. As I mentioned early in the introduction, the NICMIC process all content from US companies and is responsible to divert it to the most adequate law enforcement agency. As a result, they have partnered with hundreds of countries because some of the uploaders might be in Europe or might be in Asia or might be in Africa. And so this map shows you how today those reports are diverted. And you can see that's basically the whole world and it should give you an idea of how widespread the thing is and how complicated our communication. So while I don't have a specific initiative in mind to show you, uh, I can tell you that any kind of improvement to streamline collaboration across the world uh, with all the difficulty which come to multiple languages, multiple time zones, multiple uh, way of do working and multiple law is very important and any kind of technology here will make the world a better place. Last but not least, uh, I cannot close this talk without talking about the emotional toll of doing manual reviews. Uh, while we talk about technology, this technology is meant for and by human, and so it's very important to reflect a minute on how much impact we have on the people who are doing manual reviews. So those manual reviews are much needed because we don't have a system who can detect child sexual abuse reliably perfectly, so we have to double check. This is a very serious accusation and we need to make sure. Similarly, there is no good way for us to find all the clues which are useful to identify the victim and the perpetrator. So days in and days out, you have people in all NGOs reviewing this content and it's put a lot of toll on, the, on, on them. So what can we do? Well, what, what, what we can try to do is try to reduce the negative emotional impact of those reviews uh, by using AI. Uh, here's one of the ideas we're experimenting with today. The idea is to use what we call style transfer. So what is style transfer? Style transfer is when you take an image and you take a painting and then you ask the AI to do something a little bit weird, which is to say, please give me the same images, retain the meaning, but paint it or change its appearances 
uh, so that that is my major painting. Here's a concrete example of our very own system about it, uh, where you take an original images, a reference style, and then you get a subtle transformation. Transformation are usually more dramatic in the literature about uh, style transfer. We get them a little bit more subdued because we want to retain as much meaning as we can, and so they are very tailored to keep semantic as much as possible. While we cannot, we haven't applied them yet to child sexual abuse image because uh, you cannot review them again and again to not re-victimize the kids, we did have apply them to both violent and explicit images, and in both cases had great success to reduce emotional by, uh, distress by 16%. So we are really hoping that we can develop those uh, transformation in a very reliable manner and have them being used across the world to make manual review a little bit easier on those people, on the people who had to deal with those in and out. So, if I have to leave you with one takeaway, it will be that uh, technological shifts have reshaped how the online child sexual abuse ecosystem is, and it has led to an explosion of content that now we have to deal with. And as a community who is building technology, it is up to us to build transformative technology to help those NGOs to do, to do their job and keep our uh, kids safe. Uh, I will now take questions. Thank you from, so much for your attention.